All right, first, um, thank all of you for coming and enduring uh, this embarrassment. Uh, much appreciated. Um, two, uh, I am really honored, uh, truly honored to be receiving this award. Um, I was very moved by actually seeing the carving uh, in person and seeing the names. I looked and studied it so I knew what was on there, but it's a difference to actually like walk and see it and to see your own name being mentioned with so many people that you've learned from, studied, you know, tried to emulate uh, from beginning of the end uh, of, of that list. Uh, so I'm truly honored. Um, you know, and then I want to you have to give my thank yous because you don't, it's an individual award to a degree, but you don't get here without there being a foundation and communities and people who've nurtured and enabled you, you know, to, to do what you do. And all those folks have to be uh, honored and respected because this is fundamentally, I would say, their award. Uh, and chief amongst those to me uh, would be my mama. So uh, I want to make that plain. Uh, I would not be here without first her giving birth and doing that, that labor, but B, uh, going through, you know, a lot of trying times uh, with me growing up uh, and us sharing in that together uh, and us um, figuring out, or her in particular, I should say, figuring out to, weigh some, to make some ways when there was uh, at times very little resources uh, or what it would appear to be hope, uh, but she always found some way, you know, to make it happen. And I've drawn from that uh, very extensively. So I uh, wanted to give props to, to that and then all the folks, um, you know, who helped her along the way. Uh, then I also wouldn't be here without, you know, those who are doing the reproductive work. I have two children, you know, uh, and my wife is at home now enabling me to do this um, and to be present. And uh, we often receive these things and many people get disappeared, particularly women in the course of doing work. Uh, that enables us to be here and talk trash with all of you and share our experience. Uh, but that always has to be uplifted and, and acknowledged. Uh, so this is not something that's being awarded or received alone. Uh, and I just want to make that known. Um, Um, now, in the course of doing this, you have the title, you know, uh, which is shifting focus of what I want to talk about. But I want to put it a little bit in context, and I know, like, I have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be skipping around some things. But I'm I'm here with with I hope would be an urgent message. A because of the nature of climate change. Like the, the time we actually have to kind of plan and shift through things is rapidly, you know, declining. We need to be very clear about that. There is no model that any of the scientists now come up which actually matches reality, right? So we are in some ways uncharted territory. What we witnessed in 2022 alone far exceeds almost any model or projection anybody talked about. So the, when we witness, you know, uh, Mozambique and, and Pakistan, when nearly like one fourth and one half of their countries were flooded or major droughts, you know, being experienced from Madagascar to Somalia, uh, to California and parts of the West, right? Uh, these are projections that people put off 20, 30, 40 years from now. And if you look at, you know, what the nation states of the world are actually doing, they're acting as if we have a hundred years to solve this problem, when nothing can be further from the truth. Now, part of what the shifting focus, just to start on, on that, part of what is this asking us to look at concrete reality profoundly different. 
I want to bring up a couple of things of what I mean to illustrate, right? Because there's some obvious things that we've all experienced the last couple of years that we should be really gleaming from and learning from and then acting upon, but I don't think we fully recognize. And let me say one. We all lived through uh, 2020, everybody who's here. Um, and you will recall that the nation states of the world during the middle of the, during the early part of the pandemic, they were able to bring global commerce pretty much to a standstill. Now, what's the significance of that? So I've been doing climate justice work since the 80s, really, but particularly since 1992. I was one of the youth people who got to participate in some of the, the planning formations of what wound up becoming the Rio uh, conference that happened in 1992. That was supposedly the first major UN uh, conference. So we've been told uh, about climate change. We've been told basically since then that the world economy and the world system is too complex and too large for it to be altered in any fundamental way, right? That the problem is so big that there is no way to tackle it. You all just witnessed that when there is a political urgency, when there's political expedience to do so, they can pivot on a drop of a dime. You witnessed that, you experienced that, so there is no ability for them to lie to us again about it's too complex, it's too large, it's too dynamic a system to be altered. We have witnessed in real time that they can do it. In real time. So to me, that brings the, uh, 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 up to us why I'm saying the conscious recognition. If we have witnessed this, first we have to acknowledge that, hey, yes, I did see that. Yes, I did experience that. And then, be, you know, then, then be like, then there are political consequences and there are political actions that then have to be taken to make sure that they actually can fulfill the demands of the people that require the system to change. That is where the gap is, right? Like we are not demanding what needs to be demanded. That is a weakness on our end, right? That we need to both recognize and I'm arguing that that requires, in part, some shifts in our own consciousness, right? Because what it, in part, exhibits to me, and hopes, I'm not trying to be harsh, but to be real, I think there is some truth in our minds, at least, that we envision changing, that the end of the world is more possible than changing the capitalist system. And if we hold that to be true, then we won't build the movements that are necessary to change the future and to create a new future. So there's a battle for our own minds that has to take place in, in the here and now. Another thing is, let me bring it, if you just think that's one shallow example, let me give you another one. Basically from what, May of 2020, to the beginning of 2022, you all were part of and witness, uh, whether you agree with this or not, as a program that could be ushered, it just speaks to the potential of what can be done under the right circumstances with the right leadership, right, and the, the address need. But you all live through basically a universal basic income experience, experiment. Right, the government, the U.S. government, along with most Western governments, gave out trillions of dollars to folks to keep the global economy alive. Right, in the form of various types of cash payments, uh, tax write-offs, etc. And it became so profound that they basically led a congressional revolt to end it, and they tried to end it on the result on the basis of. Folks were making more money, right, from this disbursement than they were working full-time jobs. And what was the argument? We'd rather have folks working for less to discipline labor than to give out resources that have already been dispersed by society, all of us, right? And to end that experiment. Now, the other part that they don't necessarily talk about, like there was you know, trillions of dollars spent you know, in these kind of cash payments to keep the economy going. 
But do y'all realize it was twice as much money that was given out to Wall Street at the same time? So it's not a question of whether there are sufficient resources, right? When, when the, the, the need arises, they basically can print all the paper money that they want, at least the United States government, right? It's still in the position to be able to do that. So the question then becomes, why don't they, right? And part of that is we aren't demanding it. We aren't organized enough to make that demand. And that's a challenge that we have to take. So the shifting focus is let us, let's actually look at reality as it is, not how we want it to be. And then we need to organize based upon that. Now, one of the things in terms of what, some of the things that in terms of what I think we can do and what we've been proposing, we put out this whole uh, piece, if you want to look, called the Build and Fight Formula, right? Um, and what that basically is, is calling us to realize is that if we look at our self-organized activity, those of you in this room speaking to you, if we look at our self-organized activity, we're actually doing a whole lot. And we think a lot of times that what we're doing is like insufficient. And if we just look at what we're doing and not the aggregate of what all everybody in our community is doing, then it is insufficient. But I'll just take one example. If you probably, and I don't know New Haven that well, but I would imagine that there are a good number of like community farms, urban farming projects that are going on. And if you link that up with the agriculture work that's being done in and around this region, you have the outlines of a local, at least food security network. So what is the issue? If you have this level of production and all this stuff going on, they're not coordinated. It's not being planned. It's not being, we're not dialoguing with each other enough to come up with a plan to, to answer the question of what are the concrete kind of, you know, food and caloric needs in our community? How can we produce towards those needs? And then how can we distribute based upon those needs? That requires us to be first and foremost in dialogue with each other, building a level of trust with each other, but it can be done without in any way surrendering any of anybody's autonomy to do what they want to do, right? Communicating with you about, hey, you know, you're planting tomatoes, I'm planting corn. I don't want you to give up what you're doing, but can we coordinate and, and this enough to maybe add a little bit more to what you're doing, add a little bit more to what I'm doing, and then let's come up with the community levels of engagement to be able to provide this where it is most needed, particularly those who don't have market access or don't have the resources necessarily to go to the market, we can at least eliminate the threat of hunger from our communities. And if you want to eliminate that, those type of threats, you free up people's mind, time, the energy for them to be able to do other things, right? To start constructing peace. Because a lot of what we know on a, on a base level, I can tell you from my experience, a lot of the, the, the struggles that are going on in the streets are because folks don't have sufficient resources to meet their basic needs. And once some of those needs are addressed and corrected, then people's behavior orients in a different thing. Other things become possible, right? And then like we talk about like peace and security, the reality that we know is the communities that have quote unquote the most peace are those that are, the, that are most resourced. Right. And where there's more stress and strain from under resources, that is where you would find the kind of proverbial violence. But we need to look at the violence that's actually constructed on the front end, which keeps us all in isolation in the first place. Right. The area of the, the, the whole practice of setting up a system that encloses the commons. Right. And then puts people against each other. That was the first critical act of violence that we have to work to undo. So when you hear about elements of our program, about why we spend so much time and energy trying to build like our community land trust, why we made that a priority, right? It was the first and foremost, we got to take that out of the speculative market to enable some other things to happen. For folks for, to, to have a basic line of, of resources that they can tap into. Some place where folks in the community can come and say, I want to do a, a plot, you know, to take care of some of my particular needs. 
we now have enough you know, resources to at least start with in our community for a, a program like that to be built upon and expanded upon for some years. And this is something that we want to encourage everybody to kind of take up and do. And there are other practices like this that, that we want to put out within this formula that are built upon as links to each other that enable us to, to get outside of commodity relations on a practical community level to build more resources and more autonomy in our communities. But it requires a mental shift, right? And part of that mental shift is I need to communicate. I need to, to plan and coordinate with others in my community, right? So that we start working together on a more coordinated level without necessarily removing anybody's autonomy, right? Like that's a core piece. Because a, a, a core part of what this program is saying is that we want to shift how we practice. I'm not really interested in having a whole bunch of ideological and political debates with you, right? What I'm more interested in is how do we work beyond our differences to meet our material needs? And there's a philosophy that's embedded in this, which is we think it's easier to work ourselves into new way of thinking than it is to think ourselves into new ways of acting, right? And that if we are really working with each other, that convergence will kind of eliminate a lot of the, the political things that we think kind of get in, in the way when it's really anchored and oriented towards meeting particular need. Because you don't have to believe, you don't, your, need, your reason for wanting to serve somebody's needs don't have to be my reason. Don't have to be my. We don't have to agree on that one hundred percent. But if we agree that people's needs need to be met, that's the baseline. That's the starting point, right? We can unite on that. And then there's just some other principles like we won't discriminate in terms of who gets what, right? But we can, you know, that's the negative discrimination. But we could also do some positive discrimination, and that means like, okay, I want to make sure the children and elderly get fed. Do you agree upon that? Right, that's a democratic decision. We want to make sure the people who aren't able to be out here farming or doing a certain level of us because of certain physical disabilities, that they also get served as a priority. We can agree upon that, right? Uh, and it doesn't require folks to kind of shift their world view per se, because I think all of us have some baseline of what we want to get to. The question is, do we, are we engaged in enough work with each other to build up the trust and communication for, to enable that to happen? Right. And that is what the big part of this shift really requires. When you, when you look at that, you got to think about what are the organizing pieces and what are the social relationships that are going to be necessary to make this happen. Right. And one of the biggest weaknesses of, of progressive forces right now is that we don't talk to each other enough. Right. And we're too fragmented in, in our, our political views or you know, somebody said something bad to me 10 years ago or, you know, 30 years ago, right? Uh, uh, and I can't, you know, talk to them. I don't want to talk to them. Fine, you ain't going to talk to them, but you can plan <laughs> with through other folks without doing that. Can we get to that particular point, that level? So that is what we're really pushing out. And I think, you know, I'll leave with my final argument that if we, if we get to this level of dialogue and communication working towards these autonomies. We'll be able to basically withstand some of the, the, the onslaught that's coming our way. Because, you know, some of the things that we, I think we need to be really clear on, you know, there's this nice techno future stuff that, that's being dumped on all of us, right? So you got uh, Elon Musk who wants to go to Mars. Y'all not invited, but he's going to keep preaching about it, right? He's going to take all your money to get there, but y'all not invited. Then you got Jeff Bezos, right, who's talking about making the earth a nature reserve, right? When you think about it, I mean, that looks, so if y'all don't believe me, actually go and listen to what the man says. He says he wants to move all the dirty, polluting industries to the moon, right? move a significant number of people to outer space colonies and then let the earth heal. Now, think about how you go move 8 billion people to the moon. You quickly realize that we can't put two people up there sufficiently now. So his plan requires massive depopulation, 
right? It's with the underscore of what he's really talking about. And I will wager folks that look like me ain't included in his small club, or at least not too many of us, right? Uh, and God help those who do get chosen because they're probably going to be cleaning the joint. So that's what, what his thinking is. But this is what they're really putting out there. Now, I'm not saying this as a joke. I'm saying this, you know, concretely uh, in terms of what's being thought. So the reality we got to come with, if these are, you know, if the captains of industry are supposed to save us, right, which is what the, the neoliberal order of the world basically, you know, purports to us, like we should just go along and let them do all the planning and thinking. Well, if that's the case, there's no future for us. So we got to make that future ourselves, right? And that is the dialogue. That's why this dialogue and this planning is so critical and essential to really moving in a direction. And there's a certain baseline of skills that we need to have in our communities, right? Hard skills, plumbing, right? Woodwork, craft work, things that appear to be old, a lot of those things are going to be the, the skills that we're going to need in the future. And I'm not saying something like fictitious. I want y'all to understand we live in a profound period of, you know, just unsteady uh, uh, reality. What do I mean by that? Roughly probably one-fourth of the countries on this planet right now are essentially stateless. They have no functioning government. Think about that. They have no functioning government. Other societies are in the midst of basically total collapse. Some of them very, you know, uh, very scary. One of them, I would say, look at what's going on in Pakistan right now. How unstable it is rapidly becoming. Do recognize Pakistan is a nuclear power. That means if it kind of completely falls apart and collapses, those nuclear weapons could wind up being on a bunch of markets that anybody could use. A similar dynamic, I would argue, to a, for a different degree, is going on in Russia. Right? So let's say uh, Russia becomes a failed uh, uh, state. Not that it's a thriving one now, but let's say it becomes a failed state. What happens to that nuclear stockpile? I'm bringing this back to the to the award because it started in part around nuclear proliferation, right? And it may appear on a certain level that that is that that threat is off the horizon. I would argue with everybody here, it's not, right? That is very much back on the horizon and is being pushed because there's a there's a another part of this. If you, we really got to pay attention to is this big thrust that the United States government, both parties, are pushing towards aggravation of war with China, right? And a new program of like encirclement around China. They're not just going to sit back and kind of take that, you know, willingly. Uh, and both of them have interests, which I would argue are against the overall interests of humanity, more, more or less to serving their own interests. So how do we interject and move, you know, as, as people who are not part of either one of these nation state apparatus to ensure that there's a lasting peace. We got to get much more organized to be able to exert pressure and influence when and where we can and get prepared for the future. So we got a lot of work to do. The good thing is uh, in the periods of, of uncertainty such as this, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. So don't walk away here thinking this, anything is gloom and doom. Uh, they are very unsure. I'm saying these are like the, 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 the ruling class factions of the planet. They are very unsure about what to do right now. Right? All they have is a bunch of short-term fixes. So the more we get coordinated, united, we have much more of an opportunity to actually create what we want than we could possibly imagine. Right? So one of the biggest things is just the limitations in our mind. And I just want you to remember, right, like profound, quick change is possible. You witnessed it. Just, that's just two examples I could cite. There are more that happened during that period of 2020, 2021, 
that you can you know, point to around in so many fundamental ways the world changed. Uh, and it can change in an intentional way. That's the, the critical piece. Right? So like the, the, the great, uh, was it, sick out or uh, great, the great resignation. Imagine if we organized that and it wasn't just spontaneous. Think about how much leverage and power we would have. Right? And so what is that? If we know what's happening, right, what is stopping us from getting ahead of it and start organizing? So like all my trade union comrades out there, like there should be some serious conversation in each of your trade unions. Like, well, how do we actually build upon this momentum? Right? What type of education work what type of actual contact and organizing work is necessary to be out there? And part of this, folks need to think of within that sector, how do you think about your survival you know, as an organized unit in the face of declining membership over the last 50 years? This is a profound opportunity to expand the base of union organizing and to make it a, a serious political force in the United States and globally once again. But it just, taking a shift in, the, in imagination and then being able to engage in a little risk taking, right? To try to go, go get out there, talk to people and start getting them organized to meet their collective interests. We can do it. It's gonna take some hard work. It's gonna take some new imagination, but it can be possible. It is possible. We just need to make it happen. So I'll end there and, and open up for questions. Yes. Well, I mean, Holly, can you hear me? We 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 couldn't hear the question. Would you be able yeah, to? You're, you're not going to be able to hear the question, so I'll try to repeat them. Yeah, summarize. Yeah. Right. Um, so, if I can, in summary, um, the question was about land being in Connecticut being so expensive, um, and how, in our case, we'll be able uh, uh, to acquire land. How we finance it, in essence, right? Um, so, part of to to uh, you know just be clear and 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 about this particular piece. Uh, there's the history of Mississippi, right, relative to black people, which is one of the core reasons why myself and others came there to do the type of organizing we're doing. But there was also the factor of, of choosing it in part as one of the criteria, because there were other things that we were looking at, the organization was looking at it just you know, about 15 years ago. And one of the, the pieces that we looked at was where could we afford land? Right, that was already a consideration. Like, given that we didn't have deep pockets and likely weren't going to have deep pockets anytime in the future, where could we afford it? And Mississippi was one of those places. Uh, and what we did, um, you know, we started uh, a fund, small internal fund, in 2001. Right within the organization that used to belong to the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement that was specifically aimed towards buying land. Now we didn't buy any direct land with, with any of those, those resources until 2013. So you're talking about a 12 year of folks, myself and others included, putting in, you know, basically like a dues, self-paying kind of dues to be able uh, to execute something like that over a period of time. So there's, a, again, this is this level of thinking ahead and trying to plan that we have to be involved with and not just, you know, succumbing to kind of the urge of immediate gratification. Because, you know, we, we need to be re re recognize and be cognizant of the fact that so much of what for me that I'm doing, I'm very clear. I'm not going to live to, to reap the, the full benefits of what I'm doing, nor am I planning to, right? This is for my children and their, their grandchildren 
and folks in the community who I will never know and never meet. That's who this ultimately is for, right? And so thinking, planning ahead to try to meet certain basic fundamental needs is how we've done that. And then other than that, man, we've done almost everything creative you can think of from, you know, the, the, the bake sale to uh, rap concerts to uh, writing grants. I mean, we don't leave no stone unturned uh, to try to, you know, make ends meet. Now, we've also, you know, through our organizing work, particularly in a couple of fields like in arts and culture, uh, entertainment. We've also been able to recruit a number of different folks who have a few some resources and be able to be like, look, this this should be a, a priority. Are you willing to, you know, make an investment here in the form of a grant, right? So it's not like personally owned. And we've been able to get some folks to do that. Um, so I mean, you you have to be uh, creative. Part of the thing that I think for a place like uh, Connecticut. Um, it's something which you know is, is beginning to be tried or is, is uh, implemented the last couple of years in like in Vermont is finding folks who are willing to like donate aspects of their land uh, and be ahead of the curve to be out there trying to organize them with a social vision and a mission to be able to kind of absorb some of those particular things. So that to me, I think is perhaps one of the most viable routes uh, and and you're going to have to do some things like that to counter some of the dynamics of capital. Because unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, this New England area, the capital is one of the most precious real estate areas that exists on the planet, right? In part, you know, particularly y'all are nestled between Boston and New York, right? And, and New York being one of the capital outlays, the empires of, of the planet, you get all this pressure and all this money that floats around from folks using this as kind of a backdoor market and relief for summer homes or second, third homes. Then you got the, uh, you know, you got the university here. So all these things exert a certain type of pressure, which is going to take a tremendous amount of organizing to, to get people to believe in a broader social vision. But you have to have that social vision with some long term planning and patience, I think, to be able to execute. And we have we have a Zoom question. So Dan Fisher, who's been doing work um, behind the scenes, could you read it out, Dan? Can't hear you, uh, Dan. You're all, you're on mute. There sure. You can you hear me? Okay. There's one message from the Hall Williams family. They say hi, Dad. Uh, more importantly, there's a <laughs> or, or additionally, there's a message, a question from William Hart. What would be the first few items to do in order to approach my community about community gardening? Hold on, just a quick second. And that way we have the wireless mic for questions and all that. All right, Dan, could you repeat the question one more time? Yes, of course. What would be the first few items to do in order to approach my community about community gardening? That's from William Hart. Okay. All right. So the question for those of you out there trying to summarize, what would be some of the first things to do to approach this community about uh, community gardening? Right. Um, the first thing I would recommend from from uh, my experience and our kind of collective experience is first and foremost, do a survey of what actually exists in your community already. I would wager that there are projects that are already underway. Some of what would right, some of which are public, some of which are not. Um, you know, and, and just really do some some patient digging to kind of ascertain what exists. Then the second thing um, is you got to try to, to build relationships with those who are doing that work to ascertain kind of what gaps and what resources they may need to grow, develop, and expand. And then what areas are they, they covering, what areas are not covering. Then the third thing is from that, 
right? And that would happen some more over time. Is then you kind of figure out what we would call kind of a gap analysis to figure out like well, what now needs to be built that isn't built that would add some more capacity to what exists in our community and to be able to fulfill broader needs than what is already being produced. And then that has to be coordinated in some plan fashion. And there's there's two levels because a lot of folks, you know, produce primarily for their, their own consumption and then that of whom they know. And some of that we don't want to, I would argue, we don't want to alter and shift. So it's in part convincing those who are engaged in that type of production to either lend like knowledge and expertise of how they're doing what they're doing to be in relationship with others to expand upon that, which doesn't necessarily require them to change their productive capacity. But you do want to encourage at certain point, can you lend more capacity for folks to do it and grow and expand? And would you be willing to do more growing yourself, right? To lend to this particular network because there is a dynamic we have to be mindful of. It's not just folks, more folks being involved in these activities. That is a requirement, but there also is a level of just productive efficiency that we need to get to, right? And to be able to meet people's needs and take them out of these kind of market relationships of folks having to be dependent upon going to a grocery store, uh, but you're asking them folks to be dependent upon their relationship with each other to meet their needs. And there's a trust building factor and time that, that goes into that. Uh, and there's a knowledge factor, right? Because you can have all the great attention you want, but if folks don't know how to grow food, they don't know how to grow food. Uh, and so there's a knowledge that has to be acquired on how to do that and how to do it well. And so there's a, this is, a, this is don't look at it as an immediate thing. This is something that you're going to have to work yourself towards. We're still working our way towards, you know, a level of food security in, in, in Jackson. And we still have a long way to go in that regard. But those are some of the immediate steps that we would recommend, you know, based on, on our thing, just don't expect, you know, I don't, none of us live in an absolute desert where nothing has happened. You just may not know about it. And so the critical thing is to, to learn about it, to be able to learn who and what is actually in our communities. And typically there's a lot more going on than we suspect. Okay, we have time for just a, a question or two more. We have a lot of booths for people to, uh, take literature and look at things, a lot of food that won't eat itself. So uh, another question from the audience. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, the strategy and accomplishments of Cooperation Jackson and other related projects I think are truly Impressive, and I think facing the taxes and you know facing what we know is coming in terms of the chronic crisis and general crisis of capitalism, interference, war, and all these things, that the impulse to create sustainable communities where we can protect and survive the future is compelling. Uh, I wonder though. Uh, your political perspectives on a, on a slightly different level. For example, um, it seems to me that we can put all the pennies in the jar we want and secure land and build secure communities without fundamentally uh, challenging the structure of capitalism right. at all. And that historically what's been required is a massive political movement independent of parties so like and first in our own tradition, independent black political parties, Chicano political parties, political parties, um, as well as the actual goal of, of displacing this government. And so I wonder where you are on that and tell you why I asked. Recently, there's been these major crises, like in England, uh, first the water crisis. Than the judicial crisis that in Atlanta, there's been a huge, a huge crisis of stock city. And I have to tell you that when stuff comes into the news, all my friends, we all look at each other and we say, Who's going to call a national march? Who's going to organize people to do your The uh, powerful solidarity with millions of people in the streets. 
And I don't see that happening. I don't see a leadership coalescing around that perspective where those actions can happen and those actions in turn lay the foundation for a part of the as a public benefit. So that's my, that's my, you know, <laughs> we all come from different traditions, and, but I, I sort of like to know your reaction to the Thank you. Let me say this very clearly. We are trying to get to where you're going, right? Um, come from a very similar tradition. And just speaking for myself, it was, it was around um, the inadequacies of the, the left, how out of place the left was after September 11th, that to me gradually was like, we're, we're pushing nationally when we don't have the base to move anything nationally. So I'm not one who's just into small, isolated projects for small, isolated projects. Not my point, right? Like there is a, the small is beautiful is a real thing, but I can tell you from like our experience in Jackson, uh, right now, the state government is basically removing, you know, home rule from the city of Jackson. And they can do that because we're fundamentally isolated. So being isolated only enables you to get crushed if you're not very clear about the need for a statewide and a nationwide and an international movement. So we haven't forgotten that, but we're not abandoning that in any form or fashion. But it's just trying to like, you know, say that like the, you know, with the Black Liberation Movement, we got devastated in the 70s and 80s. We still haven't fully recovered from that. Right. And then we had, you know, chemical and biological warfare perpetrated on the community to a great extent, basically from the 80s through the 90s. Right. Victim of that myself, you know, father being a, a crack addict. Right. And, and, and taken out from that. So I'm not speaking anecdotally. I'm speaking practically. That just destroyed the organized bases and the institutions that we had in the black community. I'm only using that because that's what I know best. Right, but we're not the only community that went through that. Puerto Rican community went through that. Chicano community went through that. Indigenous communities went through that. Poor white working class communities went through that. So we don't have the, the level of just institutional and social basis in the organizing we had just 30 or 40 years ago. And I can say that about any black community I walk in. I can tell you automatically we don't have what we used to have. If, if you can go from the churches to the civic organizations, like all the different things in between. We just don't have that level of organizing that we used to. So this program in part is saying, look, there's some basics that we have to step back to and, and build up, right? To be able to be able to launch a national and international movement. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't call for nothing now. I mean, we're very, Cooperation Jackson is very much involved with, with a, a cop city. You know, the, the spokesperson is one of the Primary spokesperson we used to be the the, the co-chairs of the same organization for many years, uh, uh, trying to push out you know a certain level of program. And I think um, even you know we're we're still relating to each other through the People's Network of for Land and Liberation directly. CMB and Cooperation Jackson, you know, being kind of the two I would think main anchors of that. Uh, but we're still very clear that we don't think that it's it's. We're not opposed to anybody else calling for a national peace, but we don't yet have the capacity to kind of pull that off, right? Now, if other institutions want to come and help us and be in alliance with that, great, right? But we're not there yet. But we're also very clear that if we hadn't done a certain level of base building, if they hadn't, you know, you wouldn't have what you have with Cooperation Jackson, nor if CMB hadn't been doing this base building, nor would you have Cop City popping off in the way that it's popping off. So we think that there is some, you know, we've built a level of proof of concept around the base building work, but it's just a phase of where we want to go. It's not the end result of where we aim to be in five years, 10 years from now. Great. Maybe we could have one more question. Is there one from the audience here? Don't be shy. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, I yeah. 
Yeah, being clear to being clear about our mission to the greatest extent possible uh, enables that to happen. Also, being situationally aware. So, let me be real and concrete, especially since this is probably the last question we're going to be able to answer. Um, basically, since 2017, in the state of Mississippi, the Republicans, which in our case are uh, You know, what's going on now with the MAGA movement, whatever, that's been the case in Mississippi for a long time, right? Like the rest of the country is just growing into what Mississippi has been to a certain extent. Um, but they they acquired a super majority in 2017. And that forced us to shift a number of different things about our practice, right? So some of the things that were being described about our work, right, the way it was phrased was from an earlier period of our work. We are still working towards like a just transition plan or like a Green New Deal on a local level, but we're not talking about it as much as we used to. Why, right? The premise is now, let's do, let's make the material changes first because if we just keep promoting and we've already had experience on a certain level, we just keep promoting and advocating like strictly on a policy level, that supermajority is very fully intent on just stopping it and creating laws that would then make it un, un, uh, you know, impossible to execute without running into some criminal penalties, right? And we know a, a period like that is coming, but if they're gonna make what we do you know, throughout this country, what we try to do, they're gonna try to make it illegal. That's the phase of struggle that we are at. But we want to be prepared as much as possible for that confrontation. So we've kind of stopped. Cooperation Jackson on a certain level stopped talking about a lot of policy work relative to the state of Mississippi. Not that it's not important, but it's like, you know, with their supermajority, they just gonna create laws to say, you know, they've already done some stuff. Like, no, the municipalities cannot set their own wages. That killed our fight for 15 campaign, right? That just as an official thing. Now the pandemic made it a reality. Right. Uh, uh, but that's a reality you see with 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 inflation, which is a, an intentional act of, of capitalists to kind of do certain type of acts to discipline labor. They're trying to take back the gains that were made during that, that short period of time. But we're very clear like we need to kind of move and develop the capacity. Right. And then where the tricky part of it comes in is just, again, situational analysis. Do we agree with everything the administration does? No, not, not in any fundamental way. Do they agree with everything we do? No, not in any fundamental way. But I'm very clear that I get to play at least uh, uh, in, a, in a field with the municipal government that I have that y'all are not able to play in, right? I'm not blind by that in the, in the sense that, um, you know, we have a more progressive leaning mayor and city council that if we want to ask for certain things, we can, right? But we just need to be very clear and strategic of when and what we want to do and to ask for. So our practice has primarily been to inform, but to not ask. But we don't, we're not asking them to change certain policies at this particular point in time. It's just more or less like, look, we are thinking about, while we're working, we're, we're going to build this, you know, we're building an eco-village piece by piece, layer by layer. And a lot of that is going to require, like in practical senses, getting waivers on certain things that, you know, are kind of required. Like to be off grid, you actually got to get permission to, to kind of, you can do it, but then you might again face those criminal penalties. So if you do that, you better be ready for it. But, or you can take the other route that we're doing, like we're letting y'all know and we're going to become asked for permission when the time is right to actually pass what we've already done. Right? So, you know, it's like asking permission after the fact 
But let's set the material reality, because the material reality sets a basis that we would argue that folks in our, our community will and do support because they see the benefits of it and want to participate in also having those things. So, you know, it's like it's a situational analysis and an analysis and read of our uh, 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 situation. So you still want to, I would argue, folks, you know, on a local municipal level, try to get the, the folks that you can work with to the greatest extent possible in places to make certain those critical decisions. But you're right, you, you don't depend upon them. Because the, the, how we frame it is like, you know, and I'll leave with this, like anybody who's thinking of running for office within this system, what you're asking, you, you know, what you're taking, taking on or attempting to take on is to manage the contradictions of capitalism. If you're real and trying to move from a more radical perspective, you understand the contradictions of capitalism cannot be managed. So you've actually set yourself up for an impossible task. Understanding that, then what is your role if you're going to be an elected official? Your role, I would argue, becomes to heighten the contradictions, not try to manage them. Right? Not try to manage them in any way. You're there to cause trouble. Cause as much trouble as you can to enable more space to happen for social movements to fill in the gaps. Right? And then be able to build the space and the movements and the strength that we need to enable the people to actually take the lead and being the agents of change, right, that, that we need them to be. That's much harder to stop. But you can't have a role in creating more space, right? But if you're going to, if you walk in there thinking that you're going to manage the contradictions, there's too much history that dictates, like, the system will ultimately contain you and tame you, then you will be able to break it depending upon your orientation. That's great. That's great. There's so much more we could get into, but uh, you know, only have a limited amount of time here. I know you want to look at the booths and, and get some of the food and, and perhaps talk informally. Uh, and I we'll want just a few more thank yous. This institution, the Dixwell Community House, you know, people really put themselves together in this community to get it going again. It actually had stopped and had closed down, and they built this magnificent place. I mean, you know, go see the library sometime, this, this gym and all that. It's amazing. We really want to thank them for uh, allowing us to have the Gandhi Peace Award here. We want to, uh, yeah. We want to thank Michael Mills, who's volunteered to stay on and we, we provide some more music and Eric Stan, who's been the challenge for us. So one more. Uh, that's here for Stan. Yes. <laughs> and one more round. Thank you for standing on the applause for our now our laureate, Dr. Peace Laureate, Mario Pino. Thank you all for coming. Please look at the booth. Have some food.